Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details hope to see you on the inside done yo bros it's elliot hulse here with the elliot hulse podcast and today i figured i'd share something very near and dear to my heart with you guys so you guys know that i am a revert which basically means going back to the catholic faith in my older age at the age of 40 i was called home to the catholic church and so for the most of my life, I had been searching, seeking, and all different types of places in order to uh, increase my understanding and solidify my relationship with God. I've always been a God believer. Well, as I returned to the faith, I had to learn quite a bit. I didn't know really anything about the Catholic faith except that I was baptized into it as a child. And in my research, I discovered many different beautiful things, including a long tradition of amazing prayers. One of the things I love about the Catholic faith is are the rote prayers, the prayers that were written either by saints or doctors of the church or uh, men from many, many hundreds of years ago. Uh, that spent their entire lives in communion with the Lord through prayer and meditation and have brought us certain prayers. And among the prayers that are ancient in the faith is a bouquet of prayers, meaning a collection of prayers that are found in the rosary. Now, the history of the rosary dates way back to before the rosary prayers were actually given to us. Uh, in the early part of the church, in the early faith, uh, one of the things that ancient Christians would do would be to pray the 150 Psalms uh, every single day. And so for the most part, if you were a monastic or if you were religious or you were a monk or you were a hermit or you were a person that just dedicated their entire lives to uh, prayer and contemplation, uh, you were required or you took it upon yourself to memorize and pray the 150 Psalms. Now, you could imagine memorizing all 150 Psalms would be quite a challenging feat. I guess today it would seem much more daunting than maybe back then, uh, given that we have so many more distractions in our lives. Uh, but keeping track of 150 Psalms would be even harder and so I believe it was St. Jerome that started the practice of taking little beads or little rocks and putting 150 rocks in his pocket. And then every time he prayed one, he would put the next, you take the, the rock out of his pocket and put it in the other pocket. And so he would keep a, a running tab on where he is and how many he had left. Um, memorizing the Psalms was tough. And so there were lay people or just regular Christians at the time uh, who wanted to 
have a prayer rule in their life. And so they adopted many of the practices of the monastics and of the fathers and of the, of the, of the monks and sorts. And so they would use the same method of passing beads from pocket to pocket, but pray the Our Father. And so you would pray 150 Our Fathers a day. That was a prayer rule, something that someone would commit to uh, as a part of their devotional life, their spiritual life. And you could imagine just how powerful that is on the mind and on the spirit and, uh, and your level of, of devotional strength to commit to that many prayers. Now, there's nowhere in Catholic dogma that says that you must do that. Uh, it was just an act of devotion that many would uh, embark upon. And so in the beginning, these were, cons these were called paternoster beads. Paternoster is our father in Latin. So that began the practice of these, uh, you know, uh, having a cadre or having a, a, a bucket full of prayers that you would say every day. Now you could imagine carrying around 150 stones in your pocket uh, would become very challenging after a certain amount of time and maybe you lost one or, or something like that. So uh, they began stringing, to, stringing them together. So the use of beads in Christianity is wasn't like a newfangled thing. It didn't come about, uh, you know, by some council. Uh, it was something that early Christians did. Now, when it comes to the modern form of the rosary, it was given to us by St. Dominic, uh, I believe in the 13th, 12th or 13th century. And uh, at the time, there were a lot of heresies, like there are today, you know, which basically means people take ideas about the faith and they um, make it into their own. They make up their own ideas about what it means rather than sticking to the tradition. And uh, one, of the, one of the heresies at the time that St. Dominic was seeking to abolish was one called Albigensianism. The Albigensians... Uh, they believed that, if I'm getting this correct, uh, that creation was not really divine and that they sort of rejected creation, rejected the body. The belief was that like spirit was everything and that spirit was the most important thing and you know, neglecting the body or denigrating the body or believing the body was something evil was a part of their heresy. Now, we know that's not true for a fact because, well, not only did God create creation and said it was good, but he even stepped into history in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if creation was bad and a body was evil, then Christ would have never appeared to us in this uh, de degraded form, degraded form. So the Catholic faith believes in the divinity of uh, material existence, the beauty of material existence, and we don't denigrate it or see it as something uh, filthy or evil or bad. Now, uh, we are fallen creatures, and thus we have the passions and temptations of the flesh, and so we can use our reason, and we can use faith, and we can use our uh, mortification and, and, and subjugation of the flesh by the power of the spirit, but it doesn't degrade the, the flesh. And so that was the, that was the heresy at the time that St. That Domin Dominic was determined to help the world overcome, right? And as the story goes, one day he was lamenting at his inability to overcome this powerful heresy that was catching wind and, and catching fire on the faith, and it was growing very rapidly. And he found himself uh, in the forest one day, meditating and praying and fasting on what he should do. And the story goes that Mary, the mother of God, appeared to him in what Catholics would call an apparition. And so I'm not exactly sure what that word means, but it basically is an, an approved event that happened in history that through research and um, you know, you dogged research come to discover that it was true. And so we believe that this is true. In fact, we believe that Mary has appeared to several people in these approved apparitions 
uh, over the course of history. Uh, we don't believe that God has left us completely without revelation uh, in these days, but in fact sends those who he is with or who are with him in heaven, namely uh, Mary, uh, to speak to people. And so she delivered to St. Dominic the rosary as we know it today. Now, before getting into what most people consider to be the rosary, which is just a bunch of Hail Marys and Our Fathers and, and uh, you know, a bouquet of prayers, like I said before, what made this form of prayer so powerful were the meditations on the mystery of Christ. See, a lot of people don't know this. They just think that maybe it's a it's a pretty set of beads that people use to uh, for vain repetition. Some of those, some people who don't understand, will say um, there are a lot of there are a lot of Q and A's that are associated with it. Oh, ap apparition is a ghost like image of a person. Amazing. Okay, thank you, Carlos. So we got that. It's a ghost like image, and so yeah, the spirit of Mary appeared appeared to him in this apparition. And so what Mary taught Saint Dominic was that. The words of the prayer weren't nearly as important as the posture of our heart. So when praying the rosary, Catholics meditate on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to begin with each one of those 15 mysteries that are meditated upon during each decade or 10 Hail Marys or angelic salutations that a Catholic would pray, I, a Catholic would pray. This is so fascinating. And regardless of your stance or opinion, uh, it's a beautiful dose of history and understanding uh, of something that is ancient, but then again, also misunderstood by a lot of people. So the rosary is broken up into 15 mysteries, and those 15 mysteries are into three categories, three categories of mysteries. We have the birth of Christ, we have his passion, his death, and then we have the resurrection. And there are five mysteries associated with each one of those set of mysteries. So we'll begin with, and by the way, each one of these mysteries is associated with a passage in scripture. So you know, I'm not going to go into it today, but uh, you can look up scriptural rosary readings and uh, oftentimes a particular scripture will be re read from the Bible associated with each, each decade and each Hail Mary. And so this is completely biblical. In fact, the, the, the rosary itself is biblical. Uh, and there are many different means by which we can assert this, one of which Father Ripperger talks about the 150 fish that were pulled up out of the sea by Peter when uh Jesus told him to go deep into the waters, and uh, the weight of that is significant of the weight of the power of the rosary, and there are promises that are given for the rosary. Boy, I, I'm all over the place here. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about that because one of our one of our missions here in my life uh, and the work that we do is to help men overcome vice. And one of the one of the many promises given by those by, by Mary to those who pray the rosary is that if you continue to pray the rosary, you'll either stop sinning completely or you'll stop the rosary. You cannot do both. It's impossible to have both a consistent um, dedication to the prayer of the rosary and to continue to sin. So if you want if you're wanting to battle sin fight sin, well, this is one of the main weapons by which you would do it. Father Rickward talks about the, the heaviness, the weight of it being uh, likened unto the heaviness and the weight of the 150 fish, of course, is also associated with the 150 Psalms, so on and so forth. So every aspect of meditation in the rosary is a meditation on scripture. It's a meditation on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's get into those 15 meditations for the 15 decades that give us 150 prayers of the rosary. So we begin with the birth of Christ and the entire salvation history through Christ, you know, I'm not predating him, begins with what we call the angelic salutation. God made his way into this world through the calling 
of a virgin. He called, he sent his angel to speak to Mary, right? And so without these words and Mary's response to these words, there would be no Christ as we know him today. And so we know that the angel Gabriel came to her and repeated the words, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And of course, she asks a question, you know, he says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will give birth. And she's like, how could this happen? That's all, that's called, referred to the as the angelic salutation. The angel comes and salutes Mary, who, uh, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of Marian dogmas and things we could talk about, but that's not the purpose of today. Today's going to talk about the rosary, even though there's a lot of questions about different things associated with it. I'm going to try to keep it consistent and concise. So the very first of the mysteries is the angelic salutation. After the angelic salutation, uh, and Mary accepts her mission to be the mother of Christ, and we as Catholics and Christians, all Christians believe that she is the mother of God because we believe Christ to be God incarnate. The second joyful mystery Right? I didn't give those names, but the categories are the joyful mystery, the sorrowful mysteries, and the, um, and the glorious mysteries. Those are the three categories. The second joyful mystery is the visitation. And this is where Mary makes haste to the hill country of Judah to meet her cousin Elizabeth, who was also promised a child in her old age. We know that child to be John the Baptist. John the Baptist being the forerunner of Christ. He paved the way for Christ. They were of the same generation that we know. And so when she found that her cousin was going to be giving birth in her old age, she ran off and went to go and minister to and cater to and support her old her old cousin. And so we call that the visitation. That's a second joyful mystery. The third joyful mystery is the nativity. And so that mystery is one that we're all familiar with if we've celebrated Christmas and we see a nativity scene. So the actual birth of Christ is the third joyful mystery. The fourth joyful mystery is the presentation in the temple. And this is where Mary, like a good Jewish girl, brings her baby to Simeon, who's the uh, the priest, I guess you could say, of the Jewish temple at the time, and Simeon delivers a message to her. So first of all, Simeon has been waiting for the Messiah, as all Jews at the time were, and he caught wind of who this baby was that he was going to be circumcising uh, on, on this particular day, this important day, when Mary was to show up. And so he was overjoyed. He says something to the effect of, well, now I can go lay and rest because he was an old man that was promised that he would see the Lord. And now he did. So he could go on with the rest of his life. Um, and she, he delivers Mary some important news, an important message. There's so much going on there, uh, but mainly about the sorrows that she would encounter as well as the turmoil that this child will create in the world even up until today. So it was, a, it was a very heavy moment for Mary, but we call that the um, presentation in the temple. And then we have the fifth and final joyful mystery, which sounds not so joyful because Mary had to suffer in that she lost Jesus. Her and uh, Joseph lost him for three days. Uh, they were traveling and uh they, they lost track of him. They thought he was in the caravan. Well, it turns out that he was in the temple preaching and teaching and asking questions with the learned men of the, the day. And apparently he was about 12 years old. So they're all marveling at this kid, you, you know, who uh, is speaking with authority and asking great questions. And uh, but at the same time, also confusing his parents. And so we celebrate that as the fifth mystery. Let's back up for a moment on what that meditation might look like if we go through each one of those uh, mysteries in the joyful set, and then we'll move on to the other ones. Um, each mystery 
as we're praying a decade, which is a ten, which is our ten Hail Marys, and we'll get into the prayers themselves in a moment. Uh, rather than focusing on the words of the prayer, you put you you can do a number of things. Uh, number one of which is put yourself in the shoes of Mary. Throughout the entire rosary, we are Mary is there with us because she is the closest person to Christ through the entire time. So she's feeling, you know, just think about any mother. She feels the pain of her son. She feels the joy of her son. She, especially Mary, knowing the mission of her son is with us. So one way to sort of um, absorb the mystery through a meditation would be to pretend you're in the mind of Mary as she's going through these various experiences. Another one is to meditate on the virtues that she demonstrates during each one of these uh, mysteries. So, um, for example, the very first one is humility. And you can just imagine, you know, she's there living her life and all of a sudden an angel comes to her and she accepts a mission humbly. Uh, That's where the angelic salutation happens. Uh, the second one where she is uh, running off to go help her old cousin is charity, love, right? So there, there's a virtue associated with it. Uh, the, the nativity, the virtue that's associated with it is holy poverty or, 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 or being poor of spirit, which Jesus speaks about on the Sermon on the Mount and his Beatitudes, right? Uh, being being uh, poor of spirit in a way uh, signifies a hunger for God, a wanting for his presence in your life, a virtue that's associated with the uh, presentation in the temple is piety, right? One that sort of eludes most of us today, uh, which is basically respect for authority. She was doing what she was supposed to do, and she presented uh, her son. And then the fifth one, uh, where he, Jesus is lost is, um, I can't remember what it is, but it's associated with Jesus. And I, that one might actually be a piety and the other one's respect, something like that. But they're very similar where Jesus is, you know, uh, respecting and being respected in the temple. So each one of them are associated with a, with, a, with a virtue. If you're wanting more virtue in your life, pray the rosary. Because the rosary is going to have you meditate on and take into your heart uh, the virtues associated with the mysteries of Christ. So that covers the first that the first set of mysteries. And very briefly, I'll go over what the the, ro- the 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 beads look like in a moment. But that would have meant that you made your way all the way around the loop part of the rosary. So here we have the first set of mysteries, right? The pre the um, angelic salutation, and then we have the visitation, and then we have the nativity, and then we have the, uh, in the being in the temple, and then losing Jesus, right? So there you have it. That's one time around. So you've, you've essentially done, you could say, one rosary, right? You haven't done the full rosary, but you've done one rosary. I did one rosary today. You know, I prayed my way all the way around it. Again, we'll come back to the prayers. Many people will break it up day by day, and so that might be a Monday. Then on a Tuesday, you would pray the sorrowful mysteries. And so the five sorrowful mysteries where we meditate on the passion of Christ begin with Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is where he's praying to God in agony. They call it agony in the garden, uh, where they say he's now bearing all the sins of the world in that moment. Uh, the fathers of the church say that uh, the weight of sins was crushing him in the garden. And so he fell to the ground. And he's showing also uh, his humanity in that moment when he asks God to, if it be his will, to take this cup from him. And so this is sorrowful. You know, we can we can meditate on that. Uh, in a way that brings sorrow to our heart. The second one, the second sorrowful mystery, is the scourging at the pillar. And so if you've ever watched the movie Passion of Christ, you know this is the bloody portion of the 
of the movie. This is where Christ is pure. Well, the, the, the virtue would be considered purification, but it's the whipping of the body, mortification of the body, the pain in his body that's associated with the tearing and shredding of a scourge. Uh, a little different than a normal whip in that at the ends of the tendrils of this whip are like little rocks and little shells that would tear into the skin. And so if you ever watched the movie, you could just see how terrifying and sorrowful that really is. That's the second sorrowful mystery. The third sorrowful mystery that we're meditating on is the crown of thorns. And this is where the Roman soldiers twist a briar uh, that has spikes on it and put it on his head and beat him with a reed and and mock him, calling him the king of the Jews and so forth. Um, and so that's that's associated with moral courage, right? So you can imagine the pain associated with them digging into his skull with these giant spikes and this, and then mocking him, spitting on him. And, uh, and treating him so poorly, uh, the moral courage, the fathers say, are associated with the, with the mind, the brain, right? So we have the physical purification, but this is a purification of the mind. Think of all of our moral sins, pride, envy, jealousy, um, things of this nature. So that's the third sorrowful mystery, the crowning of thorns. The fourth sorrowful mystery is the carrying of the cross. So once again, images of, of Christ carrying this heavy wooden cross, the device by which he will be executed, is a harrowing experience uh, even to contemplate. Uh, during the Christmas or, or the uh, Easter season, Catholics will do a, a, a communal prayer called the Stations of the Cross because there are different portions of that bearing of that cross that Christ suffers. And so that's associated with patience and carrying that cross. You know, you can imagine even in your own life where you're maybe asked to bear a cross. Christ tells us that uh, he who does not pick up his cross and carry me can cannot be of me and with me. You must bear your cross. And so in meditating on that, we can think of the crosses that maybe we're cause to uh, bear in our lives and the patience that's associated with it. Or once again, putting ourselves in the seat of Mary and, and, and she had to watch all this and just how har harrowing and horrible and horrific it was for her to watch this happen. And then the fifth sorrowful mystery is the crucifixion. And this is Christ crucified, Christ on the cross and his final perseverance, uh, fulfilling his mission unto death and in his words, proclaiming that it is done. And so you can imagine uh, meditating on a crucifix, uh, seeing Christ on the cross, uh, and all it represents in its ugliness and in its beauty. And therein concludes the fifth of the sorrowful mysteries. And then the final third set of mysteries is the glorious mysteries, and this is about Christ's resurrection. And we have five once again, the very first of which is his resurrection. And so I often imagine uh, Christ coming to his disciples, and I think it was Thomas who was like, whoa, are you sure this is you? And, you know, Christ puts his finger in the wound, and they're all astonished. And it's like, wow, a bodily resurrection, something that was the tradition of the sect of uh, Judaism, that it is believed Christ resonated or, or, or was with the most, the Essenes. Um, historians differ on that, but it was of their conviction and then thus proven through Christ that there is a bodily resurrection. And so Thomas got to experience that with all of the others there. Uh, also think about, you know, when they came and Mary came, uh, it was Magdalene, noticed that the, that the, tomb was open and Christ was gone and an angel was standing there and said, he's not here any longer, right? So that's the resurrection. That is what hin Christianity hinges on the glorious mysteries. Uh, if there is no resurrection, then Christ was a liar, <laughs> right? So we have the life, the mysteries of the life, we have the mysteries of the death, but then the mysteries of the glorious resurrection of Christ is what ties it all together. And so we have the resurrection and then uh, we have the ascension of Christ. 
And so he leaves this plane uh, not to disappear from us completely, but to be more fully integrated into the world around us so that he's ever present in the heavenly realm, if you will, the spiritual realm, right? And so that's a mystery, right? That's why these are called mysteries. How is that? How is it that the resurrection happens and then he ascends into heaven, uh, but not to go up, up, and away, as Bishop Barry would say, uh, but to be more fully integrated into our lives so that he's ever present as God himself. And so uh, that mystery is associated with hope. So we got... Uh, faith, hope, and then the love of God in the third glorious mystery is the descent of the Holy Spirit. So if you read the book of Acts, you know that, uh, and if you read the words of Christ, he says, I'll send another that will comfort you, the paraclete, and he will guide you and he will lead you and he will help you perform all kinds of miracles. We read about the uh, tongues of fire resting on the disciples in the upper room, the apostles in the upper room. And, uh, and they all started speaking different languages and they went out and preached to the world, not necessarily knowing different languages, but being understood in the Holy Spirit. So the descent of the Holy Spirit, that's another mystery. Christ uh, delivers, Christ and God uh, deliver us uh, the third person of the Trinity which is the Holy Spirit into our lives to be here with us, to guide us, and to lead us to back to Christ. Uh, in, in, for, in my life, for example, it's definitely an act of the Holy Spirit that brought me back. And then the fourth glorious mystery is the ascent of Mary, or the assumption of Mary. Mary is believed to be the first person to meet with Christ in heaven after her death. We know that he opened the gates of hell, and then afterwards, uh, those who die get to go and be with him. And she, being immaculately conceived, which is a dogma of the faith, which is very well uh, believed and understood by the fathers of the early church. This is not a newfangled idea, <clears throat> though it was dogmatized, made official many you know, hundreds of years later. Uh, they all believe that Mary, being immaculately conceived, um, through a grace from Christ in her parents' womb, so she was born in sin like the rest of us, and needed a Savior. It wasn't that Mary was born perfect or was conceived perfect, but at the moment of her conception, by a grace from God, Christ came and like washed her of her sins and then gave her the grace to remain in that state of grace her whole life. So she never sinned. Um, not because, again, because she's a uh, goddess or because of the act of her own will, um, merely because God knew that if he was going to establish himself physically on earth, that he would want the perfect vessel in the mother of God, Mary. And so that's, we believe that as a result, being in a state of grace, when she dies, she goes straight up and she is with God and Christ in heaven, which then brings us to the final glorious mystery, which is the coronation of Mary. Uh, in, Jew in Jewish tradition, uh, the mother of the son is always the queen. And so to, to say that Mary is queen of heaven is only logical. It only makes sense. If Christ is king, and if you believe Christ is king, then Mary's the queen. And so it is believed that when she's received by God the Father and Jesus Christ in heaven, that she's given a crown. And so we also see in Revelations that, you know, there's a queen, she has a crown, and uh, John talks all about her in Revelation. And so we see that the rosary, uh, interestingly enough, is sandwiched by an experience of Mary. First, the angelic salutation, and then her crowning in heaven. But in between, it's sandwiched the life of Christ. So if there's no Mary, there's no Christ. I mean, this is not a, a you know a, an opportunity for me to go into Marian dogma, but I know there's a lot of resistance against Mary. Uh, one of which, which plays very well into the rosary, people would say, well, why do Catholics pray to Mary? Now, 
what we know is that our God is a living God. He's not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. And we also know that uh, Christ opening the gates of heaven for those holy souls who will be with God in perpetuity, or is that the right word, for eternity, um, are not dead. So one of the things people will say is, like, oh, Mary's dead. Well, well, that's not necessarily true. The Spirit continues, especially if it's in a state of grace and is more fully merged into the world and is actually more real than ever before. But not only that, is face-to-face -face with God the Father. And so as uh, you would say to someone who is uh, going through something tough, you'd say, I'll pray for you, right? I'll pray for you. I see you're going through something tough. I'll pray for you. So you act as an intercessor, right? Now, of course, you could pray to God if you're going through something tough. Um, but don't you enjoy getting the prayers of someone else and knowing that their prayers are being joined with yours in order to uh, just support you in that? And so... Mary and all of the saints in heaven, anybody who leaves this earth in a state of grace is with God in heaven, is right there with him. And thus we believe it is right and good to ask for their prayers. Of course, you can go straight to God. You can go straight to Christ, but it's in a way a bonus. On the cross, Christ says, behold your mother. And so we know that she's our spiritual mother as well, not a goddess, person just like us, but a very special person. And so there you have it. That, that is really the power of the rosary, if you're wanting to know. It, Catholics don't believe that it's because of the prayers. We don't believe it's because of the beads. We don't believe it's because of the rigor, which it is rigorous. And that's part of the reason why a lot of people don't do it. It's a challenging prayer. And the reason why it's so good for the soul is because you got to mortify your flesh. You got to be tough to do it. You can't be tough. You can't be a weakling and pray the rosary because it requires a lot of commitment, a lot of discipline, a lot of focus. But its real power comes from the posture of our heart. Where is our mind? And it's beautiful because if you've ever found yourself wandering in thought while you're in prayer, well, with the rosary, it's it, one of the things we know about the focus of the mind is that if you integrate the different uh ways of being a human, physical, mental, and spiritual, that you can you can tie yourself together. There's more integration. And so by having a tangible bead, well, you get your body involved. So you're never losing track. You're doing something with your hands. Um, since the early church, the, uh, the disciples of Christ knew that getting on their knees or putting your head on the ground or uh, just different bodily postures we're associated with keeping you focused in prayer. So we have that. Um, <clears throat> but it's the meditation. It is the focus on these 15 mysteries. Now, one thing before I move on to the prayers, there are five more mysteries called the luminous mysteries, which are not traditional. They're sort of new. And a lot of Catholics pray the luminous mysteries also. I'll go through those very quickly for you as a bonus of sorts. That means that they're not just three rounds you can do of a rosary in a whole day if you choose to do so, morning, afternoon, and night. But if you choose to add a third, uh, you might call it a, um, a bonus set of mysteries that was given to us, I believe in the 1970s by uh, Pope John Paul II. They're called the Luminous. And I'll go through these really quickly, just so those who are watching and are confused why I didn't include them, it's just out of uh, simplicity's sake. The three, the tradition, and then the fourth as a bonus. And so we have the baptism of Christ. We have the proclamation of the kingdom of God, which is number two. Luminous mystery number three is the transfiguration of Christ on the mountain with uh, Peter and the other apostles. And then is the, in, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The second one is uh, Cana, the uh, when he turns wa water into wine. Then is the proclamation. Then is the transfiguration. And then is the institution of the Eucharist. So you can look into all of that. In fact, you can look into all of this uh, by uh, reading a book by Father um, Don Calloway called the, uh, the, uh, the Soldiers of the Rosary, something like that. I didn't come prepared today. So the prayers themselves, let's talk about that. 
And so if you're wanting to meditate on those mysteries and you want to couple them with the prayers, uh, you can do that. And you could also couple them with scripture by finding a scriptural rosary online. Uh, but I'll walk you through the mechanics of the beads and the prayers, and then uh, and then and then we'll wrap up. So the very first thing that you would do is open with the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This was a a, a, a mini prayer and a blessing that early Christians have always done. Uh, it's the it's the most um, consistent and uh, used prayer uh, over and over again. You could do it hundreds of times a day if you like, but we open our, any prayer with the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which is invoking the Trinity, as you know, or honoring the Trinity, if you will. And then you have the cross. And at the cross, we hold the cross, we hold the crucifix and pray the Apostles' Creed. And so the Apostles' Creed is also known as the symbol of faith. I made a joke in one of my videos the other day where I was talking about how if you're in a gang, uh, you better know the gang sing symbol, otherwise you're not in the gang, and then you're suspect. Well, for the early church, you had to know the symbol of faith to be taken seriously. If you called yourself a Christian or a follower of the way, but you didn't know the creed or the symbol, well, then you were thought of as suspect, and then you're either somebody who is not fulfilling their duty by memorizing the gang sign, right, <laughs> the symbol, um, or you were an infiltrator. And so I just find it so interesting today how many Christians just don't know the Apostles' Creed. The, cre the reason for a creed is so that all 12 tenets, we're, uh, ass we're asserting we believe. And so all Christians of, through all time believe these 12 tenets of the Apostles' Creed. So we repeat it before we begin the rosary when we hold the crucifix. And it goes, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell and on the third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven where he's seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he'll come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And so every Sunday in every parish, everywhere in the world, that is repeated. Then if you notice, we've got Big beads and small beads. And so we, we'll call these two big beads, even though they're bigger up here. We'll call these two big beads, and then the small beads are in between. And so for each big bead, we pray an Our Father. And so this is the prayer given us by Christ in his lifetime. The only prayer given us by Christ. And so we repeat the Our Father. That goes, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Then you'll see like this is the tail. So before we get into the circle here, this is the tail of the, of the rosary. You'll see three little beads before we get into one more and then the, the circle itself. These three little beads are Hail Marys, and each one, stand, one stands for faith, hope, and charity. And so in a way, we're, we're praying for faith, hope, and charity, and then an Our Father. But let's talk about the Hail Marys now that we're going to sort of get into the Hail Marys, even though we'll be praying many more of them later on. The Hail Mary is a scriptural prayer. It comes straight out of the Bible. Every aspect of the Hail Mary is from some scripture passage, quote, or understanding of scripture. So I'll break it down uh, briefly here for you. Like I said before, the angelic salutation are the words that brought the word, if you will, right? The very first breath from God to assert that Christ is on his way. Hail Mary. Just think about that, you know, and again, it's not a, 
this is not uh, apologetics on Mary, but just think that those are the words that God made himself onto the scene <laughs> in, through Christ. Hail Mary. So hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Those are the words of the angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And so he says this as well. First of all, let's go back for a moment on full of grace. Uh, there are different translations that say that she's well-favored, but that's not the proper translation. Full of grace means that she's full of grace. Fully, 100%, there's no sin in her. Hail Mary, full of grace, and then the Lord is with thee. The Lord is with her, in particular, in this unique way. Unlike anyone ever before, she is the spouse of the Holy Spirit, they say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. This comes from her cousin uh, Elizabeth. When Mary comes and speaks to Elizabeth, the baby in Elizabeth's womb, St. John the Baptist, hears Mary's voice and leaps for joy in her womb. And Elizabeth, you know, taken back, says, Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. She, so that's what she says. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Blessed are you amongst women, Mary. Wow, there's something special happening there with you. And then she breaks into the Magnificat and all that stuff. Beautiful stories. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And so Jesus is like the high point of the prayer. It's like the, it's the hinge of the prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. That's the punctuation. Holy Mary, Mother of God, we believe her to be Mother of God, as Christ is God incarnate. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. As an intercessory prayer, uh, as, as was alluded to during the um, Apostles' Creed, we believe in the communion of saints. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. And that part, now and at the hour of our death, was brought in as the final part of that prayer during the Middle Ages when many, many people were dying of uh, the plague at the time. And so they were surrounded by death constantly. We may think of it as a little more uh, mortifying now, right? But the fact is that they lived with death, and so they begged for prayers now and at the hour of our death because it could be tomorrow. And it could be for any one of us tomorrow or today. It really doesn't matter. We can die. So that's the Hail Mary. We got the Our Father, we got the Hail Mary, and then there's a and then there's a, a final prayer that you will pray before going on to the next decade, which is um, it goes, Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Amen. And then it just repeats that way. So you'd read you'd read a you say a, Our Father, and then ten Hail Marys. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All the while doing what? Meditating on the mystery. Praying with the mouth, but meditating on the mystery. And you'll do that nine more times until you get to the end. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Amen. I actually forgot one part. Sorry. Right before that, right before, oh my God, uh, oh my Jesus, is um, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I know this is a lot. And a lot of prayers. That's why I called it a bouquet of prayers. So once again, it would be an Our Father, 10 Hail Marys, glory be, and then oh my Jesus. Our Father, 10 Hail Marys, glory be, and oh my Jesus. Those are all of the prayers of the rosary. And then there are a series of concluding prayers. And so to conclude this podcast, which I had a lot of fun teaching you guys the rosary here today, and I would encourage you to, to use it before I do those concluding prayers. Uh, let me just say, uh, if you're curious do some research on the power of the rosary. There's a really good video uh, by Father Chad Ripperger on his YouTube channel, Census Fidelium. Uh, there's the book by Father Ch uh, Calloway, 
Don Calloway. Um, there's a channel called um, Gabby After Hours where this young man speaks of the power of the rosary. Uh, there are a lot of promises that were given to, um, oh, I forget his name. Anyway, I'll provide some resources perhaps down in the bottom, but there's a lot of promises, one of which is the conversion of family members. Maybe you have family members that you're hoping to convert to Christ. Praying the rosary helps them. Uh, battling sin. Um, signal graces. Mary promises signal graces. What are signal graces? Signal graces are being given insight as to things that may be happening, not psychic, but just insights, uh, along with 10 others. And so I would encourage you also, if you're wanting to improve your detachment and your mortification and your strength and your rigor and your commitment as a man in life, this is a challenge. It's not for softies. And this is why Padre Pio called it the weapon, the spiritual weapon. It is the spiritual weapon. Uh, there's a lot of stories about wars that were won by those who were praying the rosary consistently, so on and so forth. It's a beautiful history. If nothing else, if you just enjoy history and you want to know more, I would invite you to do some research. Then finally, the last prayers, the final prayers, three final prayers of the rosary. And I'll pray these uh, in conclusion of our show today. Um, the first of which is uh, Hail, Holy Queen. Mother of mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us, and after this our exile. Show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. O my God, through his only begotten Son, by his life, death, and resurrection, has purchased for us the rewards of eternal life. Grant, we beseech thee, that by meditating on these mysteries of the most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that we may imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits that prowl around the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and I'll talk to you soon. Done. If you're a high-achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.